So this is, once again, nuclear and particle physics covers about 30% of your exam. And I think the best of use of the time right now would be to tell you what you are expected to know. Because you haven't done the homework yet. It's not really a review, because it should still be fresh in your mind. It's more of a, when I lecture, I tell you a lot of stuff that I'm never going to test you on. So I'm never going to test you on how to spell Mary Curie's name or who discovered the x-ray. Like That's never going to be on your exam, because I don't care if you know that Rontgen discovered the x-ray. <laughs> so now is the time to just uh, succinctly list the kind of things that I would test you on. Um, not the historical background, not how all this stuff was discovered, um, but sort of what, what they actually discover that you should know as a competent physicist and engineer. So uh, let's just go in order. Nuclear physics. So um, properties of nuclei, that's something you should know. <laughs> um, so I guess um, uh, properties of, of nuclei. So there are some very basic things that you should know as a matter of um, having looked through that poster that nuclei is, or the atomic nucleus is made up of uh, proton and neutron. And that um, there, you should be familiar with the concepts of uh, isotopes that Within the same element, um, there are n atomic nuclei with a different number of neutrons, which gives them different atomic weight and different uh, nuclear property, but very similar chemical property. Um, it's not exactly the same. How many here are? I think if you drink too much heavy water, you could uh, die, yeah, right? slower, and yeah. it somehow affects metabolism, yeah. yeah. So the chemical reactions, they're not exactly the same, but they are very similar. Um, so, so these are kind of basic background material. There are some things that I want you to have some sense of, but I want, I don't know, I'm not going to really test you. I probably won't test you, but it's good to have sense of. Like if someone asks you, what is, this, what is the scale of size of an atom, like approximately? 10 to minus 10 meters? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not asking you to memorize the Bohr radius, but I'm asking you to just know the sense of scale. So you should know the sense of scale as a size of atom is about 10 to minus 10 meters. Then this is a useful scale to compare for size of nucleus. So once again, uh, I'm not asking you to memorize any specific size of nucleus but you should have a sense of scale. How much smaller is the size of atomic nucleus? Mm -hmm. 10 times smaller, 100 times smaller, 1,000 times smaller, at least 10,000 times smaller. I think I usually use 10 to minus 14 meters, but I think it, uh, 10 to minus 15 might actually be closer. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, it's at least 10,000 times smaller than the size of atom. So that's something you should know. And I guess I have a lot of space, so let me just keep going down. Don't know how to spell size. Um, so, and the other kind of scale that you should be familiar with in terms of the, in addition to the length scale, is the energy scale. So there's an energy scale of uh, atomic interaction or like energy scale you see in chemistry, what is the energy scale of atom? Approximately. This is where proper choice of unit is very important. Oh, you guys are, all right, I'll give it to you. Around one electron volt. So I would never state this scale in joules. Uh, I guess I remember the conversion factor, but electron volts. 
the chemistry energy scale is around one electron volt. And actually, if you think about the history of the electron volt, like it has to be this way. Where do we get the scale of volt? Like how, I mean, the name volt comes from the guy who invented the battery, Volta or something. So, okay, so maybe we got the scale of volt from the batteries, which is the first like electrical things people built. Uh, what's the underlying thing that determines how batteries behave? Movement of electrons, the chemical behavior of the, the chemical things that make up the battery, whatever they are. Um, which means the scale of volt itself was actually determined by atomic interaction energy scale. So when you build an energy of unit based on that and the charge, the elementary charge, it sort of has to be around one electron volt because that's how it began. Um, so that, that's why electron volt is such a, um, such a natural unit to use when you are dealing with microscopic atomic phenomena. It's a kind of, it, it has to be that way because uh, sort of how electricity was first played with in this, in this uh, I guess, not country, <laughs> in, on this planet. Um, you have to almost imagine a different kind of scientific development to have a different energy scale. Um, energy scale of nucleus, that's not something you would have to memorize. Um, it's kind of based on this, but um, let me just write that down. Energy scale of nucleus is around a mega electron volt. It can be smaller, it can be larger, but around the mega electron volts, that's the range. I don't mean energy scale, like I don't mean mass of nucleus. Mass of nucleus is in the giga electron volt range. I'm talking about when the, in the nuclear reactions, in radioactive decays, when it emits an alpha particle or whatever, what's the typical kinetic energy of the alpha particle around the MeV? So um, uh, let me just write down a number, one MeV. So, um, so these are kind of useful in the sense of having a physical intuition is useful when you're doing physics 4A. Like I, you don't really get tested directly on those intuition th questions, but um, having a good sense of scale, having a good sense of intuition uh, helps you avoid making silly mistakes. Like knowing the scale of nucleus helps you realize that when you have beta rays coming from a nuclear reaction, that relativity might be important because you realize that MeV energy scale is comparable to the, the rest energy of the electron. So um, that's really the reason I'm mentioning it. I'm never gonna ask you what is the typical energy scale of nucleus and multiple choice says, well, I guess I could ask that. I don't know, let, let me not say too much. <laughs> but this is something that should be in the background whether I test you directly on it or not. It, so, so that's the properties of nuclei. I don't know if I'm missing anything out of the chap section. Um, did I, am I missing anything big? I'll just leave it there. Um, and I guess uh, let me call this a special relativity background. Um, so as a special relativity, uh, well, special relative background, and this actually gets covered more in section two over your textbook. And we kind of skipped over it, but I can still test you on it because it's really special relativity background. It's uh, on the idea of um, the kind of equivalency of um, mass and energy, or the way we spelled out in special relativity is that when you have a mass, it has a rest energy. That rest energy is related to the amount of mass by mass times C squared. That this is something you ought to remember from special relativity. And it's going to, it's something that gets referred repeatedly in nuclear and particle physics. It's in fact, some of the particle physics decay questions, I just give you the masses of the particles and I expect you to figure out uh, what the kinetic energy of things are as they decay into other things. So that special relativity background is, even in nuclear physics where you are not doing any relativistic kinematics yet, you should still remember that any change of energy is given by change of mass times C squared. 
So this should have been your special relativity background. And uh, that kind of covers what, sh what your textbook covers in uh, section 10.2. And this is uh, the section we kind of skipped, so I'm never going to test you on the details. I'm not going to expect you to know that, you know, uh, starting from hydrogen and uh, doing fusion up until iron, you release more energy by fusion than you lose. And, um, or starting from the other end, as you undergo fission, you gain, you gain more energy than you lose up until iron, and iron is the most tightly bound thing. That's covered here. I'm not going to test you on it because we never covered it in class. <laughs> and I won't be covering it in your, um, in your um, problems that they will get posted. But what I do expect you to figure out is if I give you the nuclear um, atomic weight with a sufficient precision, I expect you to know, be able to figure out using this what the released amount of kinetic energy is. So that's something like we, don't, we didn't have to cover the section explicitly for you to know how to do that. Um, and I guess in chapter, out of chapter 10, the really the biggest one that covers a lot of new material that you don't know just out of your scientific background is the radioactive decay. That's the portion, check section where radioactive decay, no, sorry, I keep messing, messing it up. I think it's actually covered in your section 10.4 in your book. <laughs> so um, radioactive decay a little bit, but really more on nuclear reactions. I, <coughs> The reason I keep confusing this is because I'm used to calling this simply radioactive decay. In your textbook, 10.3 will focus more on the whole lifetime thing, exponential decay. I may test you on it, but that's not the portion that I think is all that hugely revealing for many of you. Like, you guys have seen exponential decay function. Nothing there is all that new. Um, you guys know enough mathematics to be able to convert from what's called half-life and lifetime once you are told what the difference is. Half-life is when something decays to a half. Lifetime is when something decays to one over E. Like that's in simple enough of algebra for you to do that. So <laughs> what I call by radioactive decay, uh, yeah, I think I still call it that. Oh, uh, what I should call, let me call it this. I think this is going to be less confusing. Radioactivity. What I call radioactivity are the common three types of uh, radiation resulting from radioactivity. That's really the new piece of information. That's really what you should know, remember, the basic um, kind of conceptual things. You should remember that in radioactivity, there are three components of radiation, alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. Um, you should remember their properties that this is the most penetrating, least penetrating, and really that property is coming from what they really are. Alpha ray is a helium nucleus, or specifically helium-4 nucleus, and beta ray is electron, and gamma ray is energetic photon. So that's really what you have to remember. Once you remember them, then the rest of the pieces kind of fall in place because the kind of common questions you can ask or know about are what are their charges, what are their masses. And once you know it's a helium for nucleus, then you kind of know its mass. It's around 4 GV per C squared. You know its charge. It's a plus 2E. Uh, beta ray, once you know that it's electron, then you know that its mass is around 0 0.5 MeV per C squared, and you know its charge. Hmm. Its charge is minus E. And with a photon, you know that it's uh, massless, and you know that it's chargeless. Yeah. And, um, so this alpha, beta, gamma ray classification, that's what you ought to know. And I guess this is another thing that should kind of be in the background, because a question can ask you this, like on uh, uranium, uranium 230, uh, 238, one of those two undergoes alpha decay. 
uh, what are the kinetic energies of resulting particle. The, in a question like that, from the fact of me having said alpha decay, I expect you to know that one of the resulting particles is a helium-4 nucleus. And I will have given you enough information about the isotopes around that uranium-238 to be able to figure out what their, know what their masses are, or you know, read the, on, from the chart what their masses are, and, um, and kind of do the rest of the calculation. But I, in a question like that, I would never tell you helium-4 nucleus. I would never tell you that alpha ray is a helium-4 nucleus. That's something you're supposed to know. I would, you know, like when I describe a beta decay, I don't tell you that beta ray is electron. I would expect you to know. Yeah. Um, so that's a, this radioactivity is a big chunk of that chapter 10 that you ought to know. Um, and kind of uh, branching off from here is the nuclear reactions. I kind of don't want, do I want to draw? Yeah, I don't want to draw them, so let me show you. Um, it kind of, it's a collection of both nuclear reaction and fission. And I think this is a notation that's kind of similar to a lot of people already, even if you haven't taken chemistry. Or like if you see this notation for the first time, it's a kind of intuitively understandable notation. At least that's my sense. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. So when you look at nuclear reactions or fission, for example, so this is what I'm calling intuitive notation, like this. Um, so kind of intuitively, at least in my head, hey, did it just disappear on its own? I didn't know that disappeared on its own. That's never done that before, right? Yeah. That's yeah. Did you also do the thing? Yeah. Uh, it's not. Wow, okay, I, I'm happy not to have, have to hide it. Hmm. <laughs> that is new, they might have just made a change. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, they can't see me do it. Um, so when you look at this equation, I hope it makes intuitive sense. By the way, I won't use this uh, particular notation. Um, so if I were to give this on your exam, it would be written out like this. I would uh, use N for neutron, N plus, I had to tell you uranium 235. So I would give you the element, I would give you the, the weight, and you would have access to some kind of a periodic table to be able to figure out given uranium, it has 92 protons. Um, it turns into barium 141 plus kryptonium, I think, or I think it's called kryptonium, right? maybe, 92, plus three neutrons. So something like this, maybe you could write down Q or write out kinetic energy or whatever. So when you see this equation just as it's written out, I hope it makes kind of intuitive sense. Like you start out with, a, you start out with these two, turn into this. And then a question could ask, what is the resulting kinetic energy? And that's where you ought to have this background knowledge here, that if I were to give you precise enough masses of one, two, three, four things involved in this interaction, you, have, you, should, have, you should feel like you have enough information to give what the kinetic energy there is. Yeah, so that's really what a nuclear reaction is. And uh, if, uh, um, to, so, if I want to make things more complicated, um, I don't know if I have an example of that. Um, I don't know if there's an alpha ray here. Uh, I guess I can go back to the, oh, yeah, it, it comes back when you scroll back up. Um, yeah, under nuclear reactions, some of the reactions they show you are ones involving alpha rays. So I don't know how they, yeah, so I think in your textbook, they actually tell you that it's a helium-4. Um, just to make things interesting, I might just uh, replace it. Uh, I might, just to make things interesting, I could replace this with alpha. And I would expect you to know, when you see alpha in an equation like that, well, it is helium-4. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that's the nuclear reaction that you are kind of supposed to know. And 
Um, so for fission, really, the one concept, there's nothing you know, complicated you need to calculate. But under the heading of fission, what I would expect you to know is um, kind of how it happens. You know, it's uh, stimulated by cold, um, a reaction with a neutron. And the idea of chain reaction, that the resulting fission releases more neutrons, so it causes the additional fission. And if this material is packed together closely enough, you have something called critical mass that can well result in a bomb. So we talked about that in class, and that's something that I expect you to be familiar with the fission. And in terms of energy released, whether it's a fission or just a radioactivity, it's, it's going to be the same calculation. It's going to be something using this. So um, yeah. And I think that's more or less it. We decided that we won't cover fusion because <laughs> we didn't get to it. Um, although fusion does have a lot of uh, interesting application. In fact, um, the, mm, the neutrino problem that I mentioned earlier today, the reason people noticed that neutrino problem was because they sufficiently understood the fusion to work out a model of the fusion that's going on inside our sun. And so once, it, so okay, so I won't write down anything because this is not something that gets covered in your exam. But when you read about fusion in your textbook, you will see these fusion cycles. And one of the things that you will see is, uh, uh, I guess they can't mention any gamma rays, huh? Um, no, not gamma rays, sorry, neutrinos. Um, yeah, I don't think they can. All right, so it's just under the surface. It, it's not something you can actually look at here. But what I will just mention is under the surface that you kind of have to um, look up on your own is with all these nuclear reactions, some of the produced things are not uh, stable isotopes. They would undergo beta decay, and that should produce neutrinos. And um, so, so people have done the calculation, and that's where they get the expected number of solar neutrinos to compare the detected neutrinos against. So fusion is, in, in, it is interesting. It's something that if you want to be an astrophysicist, you should understand. But um, in this class, this is something that we decided to cut out because we ran out of time. So uh, I'm keeping to the promise. You, there's no homework question out of chapter 10 point, uh, section 10.6, and there won't be any exam questions out of 10.6. OK, um, so that's chapter 10. Um,